So look, why don't we why don't we get started? Uh, if that's all right with you, Professor Deseja. Yes, so uh, welcome everyone on uh, another one of these. Uh, kidney pathology sessions and uh, the star of this show with whom you are very, very familiar already is uh, Professor Ritambra Duseja. She is a professor of uh, nephrology, nephropathology rather, and um, general histopathology at, at PGI Chandigarh. Uh, she has been our colleague and well known to the community. Uh, today, in she will continue the series and she will tell us all about the uh, pathology and um, you know many other mysteries of lupus nephritis. So over to you, Professor. Thank you, Thank you. sir. So uh, today we are going to talk about lupus. <laughs> quite interesting for a nephropathologist, I believe, and must be for our clinical colleagues as well, because it's something which uh, boxes you many times, and uh, it's quite interesting both ways, clinically as well as uh, when we look at the microscope. So today, uh, before I start, like I've been doing every time, I just uh, give a recap of what a normal kidney biopsy looks like, because when we are talking of abnormality, sometimes it's important to keep in background what a normal uh, structure has to be and how deviant it is from the normal. So this is my normal glomerular scene in PAs, massive silver stain, and here you see all the capillaries are thin, photosites are small, the Bowman capsule, and the space is free, and there are no cells within individual capillaries, right? And the tubular interstitial compartment shows us tubules which are back to back and arteries which are normal with no luminal uh, obliteration and nothing happening in the wall. It is a normal structure. So now we come to the, and this is the EM, which again, as you see, a normal yes. basement membrane, endothelium on the inner side, photocyte with the foot processes here, the body being this, and no deposits anywhere. So this is something which is normal. So you, you should see something, uh, the variation from this as we talk about. So as we know that uh, lupus nephritis is one of the manifestations of SLE, and sometimes it may be the first presentation. And that is where we, as a nephropathology, we try to give you information from the kidney biopsy as much as possible. So what are our aims when we interpret biopsies for you? One thing is to assess the class of lupus nephritis. As you all must be knowing, there are about six classes, which I shall talk about. So in our information, we try to give you the class of lupus nephritis, the severity in terms of both active lesions and chronic lesions, and Sometimes uh, the, uh, the very fact is the clinical and pathological findings do not correlate. Um, there may be discrepancies when clinically the presentation may not be nephritic and we may show you proliferative lesions on the biopsies. So this has been seen for a long time, but over and large, whatever studies have been documented in literature, it has been seen that different classes tend to have some kind of a pattern. Like, Class one and two, if you see, they, uh, uh, the, the frequency of these classes, uh, this, this slide shows you, the most common class which we encounter in our biopsies or the ones which are biopsies tends to be class four. Though there are others also, class three, a uh, uh, quarter of them may have uh, class three, like the, these two series show that. All the four series which I'm quoting, uh, indicate that class four is the most common class seen at the biopsies. One third of may may not have any clinical presentation as well. Now, as far as symptoms is concerned, if you see here, the class one either tends to be presenting as asymptomatic hematuria or proteinuria. Uh, similarly, class two often as uh, isolated hematuria or proteinuria. But when you see class three and fours, they tend to have, if you see these, this column, which is of each, the nephritic presentation seems to be most common, whereas quite a, a proportion of class four do have nephrotic syndrome as a presentation. So the nephritic presentation generally with class three and four. 
when you have nephrotic syndrome, the most likely class uh, is expected to be class five. Though, as you see, you are seeing uh, nephrotic syndrome in almost all the classes. Class six, which is a sclerosing lesion, generally presents with a chronic renal failure. So there are different guidelines for uh, the biopsies when it is to be done. I think that uh, you people are um, um, must be aware of it. So I shall just proceed with the morphology. Uh, sir, you want to make any comment at this point for indication of biopsies? No, no, please go ahead. Okay, okay. So now coming to uh, lupus nephritis classification, the first, uh, there have been many classifications, but the, I'll just take up last two ones because uh, that is where we have reached. So each classification has improved upon the previous one, starting from WHO and all those kinds of classification. But lately we are using ICN-RPS classification system. So this classification system divides lupus nephritis into six classes and these are based upon the proliferation within either the mesangial region or in the uh, endocapillary component or extracapillary component or absence of any proliferation and uh, number of sclerosis glomeruli. So class one is something which would morphologically look normal and you would find some immune deposits on immunofluorescence. And as you see this table, you would realize that most of this classification is based on light microscopy and immunofluorescence. We are not taking into account EM in Though we do EM in all, all the cases. So class two, as you see, uh, as far as morphology is concerned, we'll have only mesangial proliferation, no endocapillary or extracapillary proliferation with, along with deposits uh, as would be seen on immunofluorescence. Now class three and four are de uh, depends upon number, the, number of the glomeruli involved. So in, uh, in kidney pathology generally, we take a cutoff of 50%. So if more, if less than 50% of the glomeruli are showing the lesions which we, I'm going to talk, that will be class three or what we call focal lupus nephritis. Or if they are involving more than 50%, we call it diffuse or class four lupus nephritis. Please make note of the point that we are using word focal lupus nephritis. I'm not saying focal proliferative lupus nephritis because here we are going to see a category where there, are, there is no proliferation, rather there is only presence of subendothelial immune deposits, which will look like just basement membrane thickening. So these two, uh, the, these two categories are defined by number of glomerular involved, less than 50% class three, more than 50% class four. Another another word another uh, categories subcategories which you are seeing here is A and C which refers to activity and chronicity which do exist till now but in addition uh, there as you see in class four there is something which is has been labeled as S or G so this has been removed in the further improvement of this classification or further. Uh, updation of this classification, which I shall show you in a while. Class five is only membranous lupus nephritis, which could be global or segmental. There could be a possibility that class five may be coexisting with class three and four. In that case, we always give uh, right three or four uh, first, followed by class five, because this is class three. So we were uh, talking about uh, these lesions or the classes. So what I mean to say is we were have we have classes one to six, and uh, the difference between focal and uh, diffuse lesions is the cutoff of fifty percent. If the lesions are present in less than fifty percent, it's class three. If it is they are present in more than fifty percent, uh, that is class four. Here the word proliferative is not used. It's focal lupus nephritis and diffuse lupus nephritis, which means proliferation is not mandatory to subclassify them. There could be a situation when there is no proliferation, only presence of wire loops or subendothelial deposits also fall into this category and can be 
um, uh, classified as class three, which is focal, or low diffuse, which is uh, class four, even in absence of proliferation. Another thing which you are uh, must be noticing is presence of uh, subcategories like A and C. A and C refers to activity and chronicity, which is still uh, which is still done in the latest updation, but what is has been dropped out in the latest uh, update, updated classification system is subdividing class four into segmental and global. So now we no more classify class four into segmental and global because it has not been found of any use. Class five is membranous, but you can have a, a situation, you may have proliferative lesions along with class five and class six is a sclerosing lesion or is when more than 90% of the glomeruli are sclerosed because of lupus nephritis. So now this is just a, a diagrammatic representation just to give you an over, overall view of how they differ. Like if you see first two categories, they are just mesangial disease. Class five has, looks mesangial, but then there are thickened basement membranes and three and four do have an element of proliferation. All the classes are rich in immunofluorescence by the, all the kind of immunoglobulins that complement. And this is confirmed on EM, though EM is not mandatory for diagnosis of uh, any of these classes of lupus nephritis, except for one category, which I shall, which, about which I shall talk uh, after having finished this classification system. So this classification system was updated and what were the up, uh, updated categories which were added to this word? Uh, so in this uh, in this updation, what was done was that there are certain changes. Like in uh, class two category, there was no cutoff for mesangial hypercellularity. Now it has been made clear that when there are four or more nuclei which are present in the mesangial areas, only then we call it as being uh, uh, class two. Similarly. There, were, there are no clear-cut guidelines for um, talking of endocapillary proliferation. What constitutes this proliferation? Hence, this word proliferation was replaced by endocapillary hypercellularity. The cells which could be contributing to endocapillary hypercellularity could be neutrophils, it could be endothelial cells, it could be monocytes. So it's, now we uh, don't, don't call it proliferation, rather we call it hypercellularity. Similarly, cutoff for present extra capital proliferation earlier was taken as 25% of the circumference being occupied by the proliferation in the bonus capsule, which has been reduced to 10% in the latest updation because otherwise we were missing on these presenting disease. There were no definitions for adhesions, which now they have now clarified what, uh, what are we going to call as adhesion and what we are going to call as fibrinoid necrosis. Similarly, segmental and global uh, classification importance of these uh, has been seen over the time and they have been dropped off from the newer classifications. And uh, now we no more classify, uh, subclassify class four into these uh, subcategories. So now let's see how, we, uh, how the lesions look like. So class one lesions morphologically looks almost normal. There is hardly any uh, uh, proliferation or increase of matrix or basement membrane thickening. On immunofluorescence, we will have some immunofluorescence in the mesangial region, which could be all the immunoglobulins along with complements. The IF EM will show normal capillary lesion, but there would be deposits in the mesangial as, as shown in this diagrammatic presentation also. This would be something, class one, which we very infrequently encounter in our practice. Generally, because these are indicated biopsies, we tend to see more often proliferative classes. So class two mesangial proliferative disease or class two lupus nephritis has some element of mesangial proliferation, which means some areas will have more than four nuclei in the mesangium, mm -hmm. but not within the capillary loops and on IF we will have good nice mesangial positivity with all the immunoglobulins and complements with light chains and these will be confirmed by EM. 
some amount of immune deposits may be seen along the capillaries on EM, but that does not change the class to three. Now class three and four, which is focal and uh, diffuse disease. So these are uh, classified based on, one is the presence of endocapillary proliferation, which is within the capillary loops, or there it could only be presence of crescents, which is extra capillary proliferation, or it could be just presence of wire loops like this and haline thrombi. So either there could be proliferation endocapillary or extra capillary, or there could be simply presence of wire loops in the form of these thickened cap, uh, um, these loops with wire loops, e even in absence of proliferation, still they, it will get qualified into class three or four category. There could be only uh, necrotizing lesions or healed necrotizing lesions um, within this category also, in absence of uh, these crescents or endocapillary proliferation, but these are very rare scenarios. Most often what we are going to see is endocapillary proliferation, extracapillary proliferation, less often this kind of a wire loop and very infrequent to have just necrosis or a healed necrosis, necrosis seen in the form of scar. This is just to make a point of, of the fact that in absence of proliferation, just this kind of a thick basement membranes where deposits are mainly subendothelial as confirmed on the silver stain. The, uh, the black color is staining the original basement membrane and this pink thing is the subendothelial Sub deposits. Confirmed on this massive stripe chrome, which gives it a red color. And as you see, there are no increased number of cells in the capillary lumina. So that means there's no endocapillary hypersolarity, but still, we are going to use this morphological uh, change as either being class three or four, depending upon uh, how many glomeruli are affected. EM of this uh, kind of a non-proliferative lesions are going to look something like this. There would be massive subendothelial deposits like this, like this, and lumen showing us haline thrombi like this. So this is a, a stage where there has already been too much of immune deposits but reaction has not begun. Endocapillary hypercellularity is in fact a reaction to these deposits, which will happen in some uh, in a while. So once we have seen this uh, these kind of lesions, then you try to look whether they are present in less than fifty percent of the glomeruli, so that is class three. If it is present in most of the glomeruli, more than fifty percent, then it will be lupus class four. Then. Uh, um, so that's why we tend to do multiple serial uh, sections on each section and multiple stains. They, that, that gives us an opportunity to classify these lesions more accurately. Now in each lesion, uh, in each biopsy, we also tend to give you activity and chronicity scores because they probably help you to decide whether how much uh, intensely you can treat these uh, patients because an active lesion can be reversed by uh, the, treat, the active treatment which you are going to give. And if the, most of the lesions are chronic, maybe further treatment may not be of any use. So what are the pointers which are used to uh, uh, calculate this activity in chronicity is, one, the uh, first most importantly is endocapillary hypercellularity. All these lesions are graded on the score of zero to three, where each slab is of 25%. So if it is less than 25%, it is given a score one, 25 to 52. And if more than 50% of the glomeruli are having hypercellularity, I will put it as grade three. So each of these parameter would be graded and added up to give a cumulative activity score. Here, two scores which are uh, have been highlighted in yellow are given more importance because they have more meaning as far as treatment is concerned or as far as their prognostic values is concerned. So neutrophil or karyorectic debris, which means necrosis. Uh, here, uh, this, is, uh, this is important. And again, it is graded on a score of three. And because of this necrosis, generally, uh, uh, whenever there is fibrinoid necrosis, that is what uh, results in formation of crescent. So 
So fibroid necrosis and crescents are given a score which is doubled. So that means if I get a score of three, I, I will multiply it by two. So that will be great uh, activity score of six. So if you have crescent and necrosis in more than 50, more than 50% uh, of the glomeruli, so uh, uh, simply by that, the grade of six will be calculated. Haline deposits are again wire loops, so they also are graded as activity. Interstitial inflammation, which is independent of scarring, that is also an active lesion and again scored like uh, at the glomerular scoring. As you see, most of the scores here were related to glomeruli. It's only the interstitial inflammation uh, in absence of any chronicity will be given importance and will be included in a activity score. Similarly to uh, a certain chronicity, we take into account the fibrous crescents. Tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis are taken, is given importance here because as you know, in most of the glomerular diseases, the, the chronicity is uh, the response, the further response to therapy is largely determined by how much damage it has caused secondarily in the tubular interstitial compartment. So tubular atrophy and interstitial uh, fibrosis, which usually go hand in hand, are graded again on this uh, uh, scale of zero to three on a slabs of 25%. The fibrous crescents are included in chronicity, whereas fibrocellular crescents are included here. So that is why in definitions of uh, glomerular diseases, now they have clearly defined what is cellular crescent and what is fibrocellular crescent because they have a significance in um, being getting counted in whether it's an active lesion or a chronic lesion. So depending upon these uh, activity, active lesions and chronicity, we would always mention in our report uh, what, is, uh, what is the cumulative score and we tend to give you also individual scoring just to give you an idea what, what is kind of happening in the biopsies, whether this uh, uh, um, increased score is because of wire loops or is, is it because of necrosis, right? Then coming to uh, another important point, which, we, which is very often seen in uh, lupus nephritis is that each biopsy may show us variable degree of morphologies. Same biopsy showing me one or two glomeruli having mesangial disease, other ones having crescents, and maybe one or two having proliferative lesion and same glomerulus having both uh, wire loops with haline thrombi and endocapital proliferation. This kind of a morphology is generally not seen in other glomerular diseases. Now, just some of the uh, representations of what we took as endocapillary uh, activity in uh, indices. So this kind of uh, endocapillary hypercellularity within the capillary loops where neutrophils are present is a feature of activity. Subendothelial deposits, which look like wire loops and presence of these haline thrombi again is taken as activity. Presence of fibrinoid necrosis like this uh, is a feature of activity, and this will be multiplied by two to uh, ascertain its importance. Tubular interstitial inflammation, it has to be an active inflammation in presence of edema, not like this, which is present in a background of fibrosis. Blue color means fibrosis in mass and strychrome. If you see inflammation there, that is not active lesion because that is a response to fibrosis, which is generally seen whenever there is atrophy in any uh, part of the, in, of the biopsy. So only active interstitial inflammation is graded and taken into as a part of being active disease. Uh, on immunofluorescence, all the, all, whatever lesions I've shown you, we often talk of full house pattern. And what we mean by full house pattern is when I'm seeing immunofluorescence, the panel of immunoglobulins, that is IgG, A and M, all of them will be present or more or less they, are, will, they will be of the equal intensity or what we call they will be co-dominant. Similarly, C3 and C1Q, again, both the complements will be present and they again will be almost co-dominant. And this kind of a thing with all immunoglobulins and all the complements which we use in our panels are present. That is what is called full house pattern. So even in biopsies where uh, uh, sometimes when the clinical scenario, I'm not told that 
this patient has lupus or uh, other manifestations are not there, presence of full house pattern to me, uh, we, we do suggest a possibility of lupus in those cases. This is another example where all complements and immunoglobulins are present. Sometimes presence of this kind of a tissue ANA, the nuclei shine upon on our immunofluorescence. This again only happens in biopsies of lupus nephritis. So if present and if clinical scenario has not indicated that presence of lupus nephritis, we do suggest that we should you should look on for presence of uh, SLE or lupus being there. Similarly, extra glomerular positivity along the tubular basement membranes and maybe even in the blood vessels is, a, is another indication to suggest presence of lupus nephritis mm -hmm. when it is not already known. Now, uh, coming to uh, uh, two, uh, two features other than IFTA, which I told, the presence of healed lesions, the scarred necrosis is also taken as a part of chronicity and a fibrous crescent is also a part of uh, a chronic lesion. This fibrous crescent needs to be differentiated from intraglomerular fibrosis because you may have, if a patient is relatively old, you may have an arteriosclerotic scar. So that should not be counted while you are assessing the chronicity uh, in terms of fibrous crescent. So a fibrous crescent generally tends to dissect the glomerulus. You see, you have a part of the glomerulus entrapped between this scarring lesion. Whereas if it is a arteriosclerotic intraglomerular uh, fibrosis, it will surround it. It will choke it from the all the sides, it will not dissect it. So that is how we tend to differentiate between a intraglomerular fibrosis versus a fibrous crescent while assessing our, uh, you know, our lesions for presence of uh, fibrous crescents. Now, a few pictures uh, here, just to illustrate that on EM, if this was class two or one lesion, that means there were only mesangial deposits, the presence of occasional subendothelial deposit does not change my class. Still, I will go by uh, light microscopy and immunofluorescence finding. Presence of these kind of a massive subendothelial deposits is, is a point where I should look at a higher magnification to look for organized deposits. Because these kind of organized deposits in the form of what you must have heard of thumbprints. These are the uh, thumbprints kind of a uh, uh, organization of these deposits seen in cases of lupus nephritis, which is generally because of uh, presence of uh, increased amount of, I think, alpha interfer interferon. The same intention, presence of tubular reticular inclusion, which you are seeing here on the previous. So you are seeing some tubular reticular inclusions here they are also a, a sign to indicate the presence of activity uh, of an active lesion and seen generally always in an active uh, kind of a lupus nephritis. So presence of massive deposits is, a, is the point when you should always go to a higher magnification to look out for uh, presence of organized deposits. Now, coming to non-proliferative class, another uh, lesion that is class five. So whenever you have diffuse basement membrane thickening like this, you see here, that is class five. Uh, on, in, uh, on silver, again, it will show you a diffuse kind of, kind of basement membrane thickening without any subendothelial deposit at, as we saw in class five. And a closer examination may show you these kind of uh, spikes if it is uh, a class, if it is a stage two of membranes. On immunofluorescence, what you see is only the membranes, uh, the membranes are showing you this kind of a granular deposits along with mesangial deposits. These areas are mesangial. Uh, in a primary membranes, uh, which is not in a setting of lupus, these mesangial areas are free. You do not see any deposits in the mesangial areas. So presence of mesangial deposits, even if you don't know that this patient is lupus, would indicate to us that this is secondary membranes which uh, one of the most important causes of which is lupus nephritis. This is just a high part to show you why I'm calling this membranous and not class four because of this kind of a granularity which we are seeing along the basement membranes. 
though mesangium is also having deposits, but the this, this kind of a dot, dot, dots which are seen on the outer aspect is what we are going to look for in a membranous. And this membranous, these kind of a dots or a granular deposits have to be seen in more than 50% of the uh, area examined in each loop, in each glomerulus, and in more than 50% of the glomeruli. If it is present short of that, you will not add a class five if, along with four in case that is the scenario. So just appreciate these dots. That, that is what will make it membranous along with mesangial deposits. Uh, on EM, along with mesangial deposits, what we are seeing is these brown, black electron dense immune complex type of deposits on the outer side of this basement membrane and covered by these uh, effaced food processes, these ones. And at places you see a new membrane has been laid in between like this, which makes it stage two of membranous. So these kind of massive uniform subepithelial deposits along with mesangial deposits, what we see in class five of lupus nephritis. Uh, a closer view to show you these deposits. Uh, sometimes uh, this may coexist with proliferation, proliferative lesion, and I've already mentioned 50% of the tuft and at least 50% of the glomeruli and has to be on LM and or IM. EM is not taken into account while we are doing this kind of a class uh, differentiation. So it will be present on EM. Uh, when it's present on LM or IF, it is going to be present on EM, but definitely the classification, as I mentioned earlier, is largely based on IF and morphology. So this is a picture where we are seeing class four uh, lesions of class four kind of a lesion where it was by loops like, and in the same loop, you are having massive subepithelial deposit also. So this is something very classically seen in lupus nephritis. Uh, now class six lupus nephritis. So class six lupus nephritis we call when 90% of the glomeruli which we have seen are sclerosis. These 90% uh, of the glomeruli which are sclerosed should not be because of arteriosclerosis. So they should have died because of lupus lesions also only. So uh, that there is a way of kind of assessing that. And that is when we will uh, label it as being class six lupus nephritis. So just uh, this has been put into an algorithm. So if my lesions are only mesangial, I will try to see the cellularity. If there is hypercellularity, it is class two. If there's no hypercellularity, it will be class one. Presentation could be uh, either hematuria or proteinuria, nephrotic range. Then um, if the lesions are showing us presence of endocarpus hypercellularity, again, less than 50% glomeruli or more than 50%, and divide them into class three or four, right? Then if there is no proliferation, mesangial or endocapillary hypercellularity, only walls are thickened because of subepithelial deposits, then it is class five. If this thickening is because of subendothelial deposit, it is class four. If more than 50% of the glomeruli are sclerosed, then it is class six. Uh, the tubular interstitial disease, I, as I mentioned, uh, generally is seen with class four or three. Uh, these cells tend to be mostly T cells and monocytes, and you may see immune deposits along with that or not, but it, the, it's not mandatory. You may or may not see immunofluorescence, which is positive. Even in absence of immunofluorescence, that is labeled as active tubular interstitial disease. Now, another important component of uh, lupus uh, nephritis is vascular involvement. Though these have not been given very important place in our cl uh, classification system, as you see, most of our classification were uh, kind of uh, using glomerular pathology of interstitial uh, inflammation or atrophy. But uh, we are supposed to mention any vascular lesion if present in, in the biopsy because they also have a significant role in uh, deciding how the biopsy or the kidney is going to behave. So there are about five kinds of lesions which we see. 
most common would be arteriosclerosis or arteriosclerosis arteriosclerosis then the next common one is just having presence of de immune deposits in uh, in a uh, in a vessel which looks normal on morphology then there are these three other lesions which are less common one is called is lupus vasculopathy then is thrombotic microangiopathy and then is necrotizing vasculitis so this necrotizing vasculitis is like any vasculitis but along with presence of immune deposits vasculopathy is presence of immune deposits but no inflammation and no necrosis and thrombotic microangiopathy you uh, all know when uh, when we call endothelial injury with presence of fibrin so uh, this can occur in different settings it can occur in a setting of uh, uh, coexisting hus or ttp presence of anti uh, phospholytic and uh, anti phospholipid antibodies or a coexisting connective tissue disorders so uh, presence of tma should incite us to carry on further investigation so just a morphology of what i just uh, talked about so you may have a normal uh, artery but on immunofluorescence you see some deposits igg or whatever deposits so the, that is what we label it as as uncomplicated vascular immune deposits in the, in the report it may not have much significance then you may have presence of this kind of a fibrin thrombi in the capillaries or maybe in the arterioles or maybe relatively bigger artery fibrogen will help us picking up these lesions if not uh, visible very uh, sometimes it, this may help us um, it may aid in picking up some of the lesions though on morphology we always I, we are always able to pick up the subtle lesions also so clinical scenarios i have already mentioned so this needs to be mentioned in our reports and further investigations if not done needs to be carried out one of the uncommon lesions which uh, we do find uh, and we have seen at autopsies also and sometimes in the biopsy also that the artery shows presence of something which looks like wire loops or these are haline deposits no fibrin no necrosis on immunofluorescence they are rich in immunoglobulins whether igg m c3 or whatever so a uh, so uh, artery having lots of deposits it looks haline but have not incited any necrosis or inflammation that is what lupus vasculopathy means right sometimes like in this case uh, this lupus vasculopathy has resulted in an infarct in the uh, in this kidney this was picked up on a yeah. section yeah. Right? Yeah. similarly an artery may show you presence of fibrinoid necrosis along with inflammation resulting in this kind of ectasias which have immunofluorescence which is positive with immunoglobulins and complement at uh, so since there is necrosis and uh, the neutrophilic debris being there along with fibrin this is what we are going to call as necrotizing immune complex mediated vasculitis depending upon the size of the artery involved you will call it pan like or whatever uh, level of artery is involved you will label it accordingly so this can be seen but very infrequently so this these were the uh, lesions which are seen in uh, kidney biopsies of lupus nephritis any of these could be present but most often is arteriosclerosis followed by uncomplicated immune deposits were, and we should always mention them in our report another uh, lesion which we tend to uh, uh, report in our uh, kidney biopsies is lupus podocytopathies which means that whenever uh, the clinical degree of uh, the clinically the degree of proteinuria is not being explained by the degree of uh, uh, membrane changes which we are seeing then we tend to report lupus podocytopathy being there because uh, if i have only class 1 or 2 type of lesions but the degree of proteinuria is really significant in th that scenario i will call it lupus podocytopathy since it's a case of, a case of lupus they are going to be presence of some immune deposits in the mesangium right so for this you need to show food process effacement in more than 50% of the uh, uh, loops examined in absence of any subepithelial or subendothelial deposit so this is important that 
the lesions on morphology are mild. It's not membranous. There are no subendothelial deposits, but degree of proteinuria was very significant. So in that case, we will look at EM. And if there is significant eff effacement of food processes in absence of any subepithelial or subendothelial deposits, then I will add a component of possibly a lupus photocytopathy is present. Like see this case. Here, what we are seeing is only mesangial disease. So it looks like class two lupus nephritis, but this patient had about six gram proteinuria. IF is also only mesangial. So when I reach the level of EM, I see there is global effacement of food processes. So in this scenario, I will add a component of uh, uh, lupus photocytopathy being there. And another, uh, this picture is depicting that there could be a, a coexisting collapsing lesion in the setting of lupus. That also needs to be mentioned because that again will have some bearing on the prognosis of the patients. So these are some of the photocytopathies which can coexist. Sometimes uh, in a patient of lupus, you may have this kind of uh, what we call thrombotic microangiopathy like changes. IF being negative, DSDNA and other things are supporting presence of lupus nephritis. There is only endothelial swelling which is present and when investigated, the APLA is found to be positive. So ap changes of APLA may be seen only in the arteries in the form of this kind of a thrombosis or it may be seen in glomeruli which looks like MPGN with this kind of a fluffy basement membrane thickening, what we call as an MPGN pattern but it is negative on immunofluorescence. So if you have APLA being positive and a morphology which looks like MPGN, no immunofluorescence, then that is what we call as APSN or antiphospholipid syndrome nephropathy. So we just have to be aware of this kind of situation because they do happen once in a while in everybody's clinical or pathology practice. On, on EM, obviously, these lesions are not showing to, going to show us deposits. They will only show subendothelial damage like this. There is this kind of a subendothelial pale material, which is consistent with uh, thrombotic microangiopathy being there. This is my last slide. And here, this is uh, more of a clinical context. Like what I just wanted to make a point was that now, many uh, times we get repeat renal biopsies and there are clinical indications. Some people do as a protocol biopsy. So in our center, we, ha uh, we have done, I think, both ways, protocol biopsy as a protocol biopsy as well as indicated biopsies. Whenever there has been flare or non-response to the uh, treatment, then we, get, uh, to get, uh, we do get a repeat biopsy where we tend to tell whether there has been a switch or change in the class of lupus nephritis which was already existing in the previous biopsy or whether any uh, degree of interstitial damage has um, uh, increased or uh, uh, any change has happened in terms of tubular interstitial damage. So I think this is all I think we need to know about lupus nephritis as far as pathology is concerned. Over to you, sir. Can we have some questions or something? Thank Absolutely. Thank you, Professor Deseja, for uh, that very comprehensive illustration of the range uh, of renal pathological abnormalities in lupus nephritis. And the range that you see in lupus is hardly uh, present in other conditions. So thanks for explaining all of that very patiently. Uh, we do have some questions, but I would also encourage you to uh, ask questions if you have any. Please pop your question to the chat or uh, raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly to Professor Nada. But please do remember to raise, uh, use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. So uh, let me start with a few questions that are already in the uh, chat, uh, Professor Nada uh, and Professor, sorry, Professor Duseja. So uh, what, where does collapsing glomerulopathy and standalone lupus fall in? And standalone lupus follow. I think collapsing glomerulopathy, we always keep an eye on this because uh, it, it does coexist. And only caveat there is, you have to look at the uh, vascular pathology along with that because sometimes thrombotic microangiopathy uh, present in uh, the biopsy can initiate an ischemic collapse. So, which may have a different connotation 
there's a with a collapsing glomerular pithy per se but uh, it does happen and we ha uh, we have seen um, in our experience also that uh, uh, cases of lupus nephritis can have a component of collapsing glomerulopathy but we always tend to make a note of if there is a vascular tma then i tend to make it could be because of ischemic collapse because of vascular occlusion thank you uh, dr henerita okafor uh, points out that this really highlights the need to go beyond light microscopy but i do see that dr oguchi onu has her hand up she also had a few questions in the chat but maybe you can uh, go ahead and ask those questions in person ogochi okay i'm not talking about the questions i posted i just wanted to make a comment but the questions you can still ask her directly go ahead make your comment Okay, so the comment is um, I want to thank uh, Professor Tambra for this uh, detailed uh, lecture. I want to point out, even though we frequently do uh, biopsies, that lupus nephritis is, is the sixth commonest lesion we encounter in our biopsy series for our patients with chronic kidney disease. And like she also pointed out, class four is the most frequently encountered lesions. For us nephrology, sometimes we try to make some clinical correlations. Um, when we see a patient who is coming with proteinuria and um, hematuria, which suggests a proliferative event for most of those patients, when we biopsy them, we see either lupus class four or class three, and it has been consistent that way. But the other questions, sir, you can help me ask her directly. Thank you. Thank you, Ogochi. Yeah. Ifoma, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. I actually asked my question because I know the handicap we have. Um, I know we do biopsy in my center, but most centers don't do biopsy. And they want to be able to uh, uh, at least make some form of um, diagnosis or some form of suggestion of what uh, type of lupus uh, uh, they have. So uh, I'm looking at what happened in uh, um, in uh, dermatology where they have syndromic management for cases so that people that don't who don't have access to advanced um, uh, pathology analysis can at least give some treatment to their patients because as we do this we have to consider others that are in situations where a lot can be done thanks that that's a real problem that that you described before ma. and uh, professor dusaya would you like to uh, repeat uh, what you said already uh, in terms of the clinical pathological correlation and how we can make a guess about the possible renal histological diagnosis on the basis of the clinical features? Yeah, like uh, the, the people have tried these kind of uh, correlations and attempt, but most often, like uh, as uh, even Dr. Ono mentioned, that um, a class four tends to be... Uh, Class three and four tend to be net have a nephritic presentation. If it is yeah. nephrotic presentation, generally it is class five or four. Though even class one, two, six also had some nephrotics and even had some nephritic presentation. So the proportion would be less. But if it is a nephritic presentation, likely it is going to be class four or three. And if you have a relatively heavy proteinuria, maybe then coexisting um, five or maybe podocytopathy is something which is like just a guesswork, I would say. But these kind of uh, um, analysis has have come up come off from these four or five series which I have quoted. But uh, in fact, practically see, seeing in patients for that particular patient, sometimes we have seen that presentation is perfectly like nephrotic and what we are seeing is uh, class four lesion even with crescents so then you call your uh, nephrologist and say like i am seeing class four i don't know but you said uh, it's uh, the presentation doesn't have any nephritic presentation but this kind of a correlations are well documented in literature and you do come across practically in your experience thank you we have some questions uh, first of all from dr Ugochi. Uh, is electron microscopy compulsory for the diagnosis of podocytopathy? And what are the components of podocytopathy? Uh, EM is uh, practically 
speaking yes i would say because without seeing em we generally don't call podocytopathy but if you don't have em and if your morphology if your presentation is heavy proteinuria and if is not showing you membranous then uh, by uh, guesswork we can always say that uh, the amount of proteinuria can only be explained by some podo, uh, podocytopathic damage the only thing is i think podocytopathic damage do respond to treatment and uh, that is only we are explaining unusual proteinuria in, in a clinical setting so essentially you won't, you should not make a diagnosis of podocytopathy without em yes very important lesson uh, that you can suspect but you can confidently diagnose only by electron microscopy uh, there is a question from dr hardik uh, are wire loop lesions seen in all classes of lupus nephritis? No, they are not. And uh, um, I think uh, proportion wise, they say only up to 15% of the lupus nephritis will have uh, wire loops. So it's not mandatory to have uh, wire loops in all biopsies. Not all biopsies, but uh, can they be seen in all classes of lupus nephritis? For example, can wire loop lesions be present in class two? No, no. A presence of wire loop lesion would change my diagnosis to class three, even if I see single wire loop, because right. that is a component of. Uh, it indicates presence of immune deposits and is a component taken as for classification three or four. So three or four. So I think your message is that if if you see wire loops, uh, restrict yourself to three and four. All right. Yes. Great. Uh, Doctor Shamna has asked a question class five when coexisting with class three and four if um, does it does it require the uh, certain proportion of glomeruli to show uh, membranous change for example more than 50 percent yeah that that i think i mentioned at least 50 percent of the glomeruli showing at least 50 percent of the loops having membranous pattern there was some degree of Subepithelial deposits in class and three or four is very common. You are going to have both by IF and EM some deposits which are subepithelial in location. So we do not add class five unless 50% criteria is kind of fulfilled. We have a comment from Mahesh, who is uh, well known to us. Uh, he's a nephropathologist himself. So, Mahesh, I won't read your question. Why don't you? You go ahead and uh, ask your question or make any comment that you want to. I'm um, uh, like when we have a biopsy for the interpretation, and if the clinical presentation is like nephrotic or uh, nephritic, and uh, just to have a, a number of uh, gloms as in terms of adequacy to interpret the clinical presentation, just a comment about that, man. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, when we are short of gloms, like how do we put it across? I, I think uh, the the very the very uh, basis of having criteria of having number of glomeruli are basically in these situations where the number of glomeruli matter in kind of classifying it. Otherwise, as we all know, even single member glom with membranous is membranous. It doesn't matter. But it's only class three, four, FSDS where number matters there. That is why the number uh, has been kind of made essential that you should have at least 10 glomeruli because it has been worked up over the years. I think that if you have 10 glomeruli, you are able to predict these classifications or classes better in, rather than having, suppose if I have only four glomeruli, two of them are showing me crescent and I label it as class, um, class uh, uh, four, but in fact, it, these four were out of 12 uh, glomeruli which were having proliferation, then it was class three. So the number actually really matters in these kind of stages only. Manisha, I think that's uh, we've been experiencing in a practically routine also because, and to circumvent this uh, as a pathologist, what we do when we are short of glomeruli or LM, we would reprocess the immunofluorescence tissue into uh, the paraffin tissue just to ha have a good number of glomeruli to kind of a give a right kind of classification rather than just uh, using our LM4 having in inadequate number of glomeruli giving us the uh, kind of a wrong uh, information. Thank you, ma'am.
I mean, the, other, uh, the other one, other side of this, it would be like uh, if we have a, a, a bioclinical presentation of nephrotic with nephritic in terms of low C3 mm -hmm. or uh, urine being active. Uh, yeah. the, uh, and we, on the histology, we do see only the basin membrane thickening, uh, and the IF is also correlating with that. Uh, just with the step serials to rule out if there is any associated focal. Uh, proliferative changes to uh, correlate with the clinical counterpart of uh, hypercomplement anemic uh, lupus. Yeah, 100% agree with you because uh, these are the only things we have in our hand to do serials to give maximum out of whatever tissue we have to explain the clinical context. Though we may fail uh, eventually in some cases, but I think doing all these exercises of doing serials using IF tissue we uh, we are kind of these all are the ways to make maximum out of whatever tissue is available from the patient to uh, give the clinical uh, to answer the clinical questions thanks ma'am thank you mahesh for asking that question and to both of you for sharing some tips and tricks on how you can maximize information from a limited amount of tissue when it's available uh, so just one question also, which uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure comes to the mind of uh, clinicians is what are the features that, let's say, if you have a biopsy and you are uh, finding uh, features suggestive of membranous nephropathy on uh, light microscopy and immunofluorescence, what are the, uh, key, what are the giveaways that uh, point you in the direction of uh, suspecting lupus in such a biopsy? If the patient has does not have any extra renal features which alert the clinicians that this may be lupus yeah so in in that scenario uh in membranous if i see any component of endocapillary hypercellularity or even if i see a single student, so due to morphology that would be one clue when i see immunofluorescence if i see presence of c1q because c1q is general is a uh, pathway of classical pathway, which is uh, operational in lupus nephritis or most often rheumatological conditions, whereas primary membranous uh, has an alternate complement pathway functional. So if I see C1Q on immunofluorescence, if I see full house pattern, that means if I have Ig coexisting with my uh, IgG uh, and presence of mesangial deposits on immunofluorescence. So three features, mesangial deposits, IgA being co-dominant, and presence of uh, C1Q on immunofluorescence. And then when I come to EM, if I have presence, uh, confirm my presence of mesangial deposits and presence of tubular reticular inclusions, if present, that will be the situation where even if I don't know the clinical scenario, I would suggest a possibility of this membranous being of lupus nephritis rather than being primary membranous. Similarly, if any extra glomerular deposits, tubular or a tissue ANA, again would push me towards it being lupus nephritis class 5 rather than being primary membranous. Great, thank you. And of course, you will now look for some special antigens also, yeah. uh, wherever applicable and available. Right. Exostrosis is the one which I think going by whatever experience has been there, like all uh, the autoimmune kind of diseases, including lupus, exostosis one and two are going to be positive in membranous of uh, lupus and other rheumatological conditions. Great, thank you. I think we have run out of all the questions. Uh, unless there are any other questions, uh, if I might invite you to, as the co-director of this program, to uh, make your comments and, and then close the session. Yeah, thank you. Just left to say to thank you, uh, Professor Ja, for organizing this, and to Professor Ritambra for giving us such a uh, illuminating lecture on uh, Ellen. I'm sure we have learned a whole lot. I keep trying to spread the word in Nigeria for many of our centers to join, and as I see that our numbers are increasing. At some point, we are about sixty. So thank you very much for this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Duseja, and thank you, Ifoma, and all the other colleagues. We'll meet again in a month's time. Yeah, sure, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. bye.